Good morning, everyone, or good evening if you're in uh, my side of the world in Australia. Um, and welcome to day two of ESMOCONF 2021. My name is Martin Westgate. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon, along with uh, Neil Hadaway. Um, and I'm also, during the day, I'm the science advisor to the Atlas of Living Australia, and I'm a visiting fellow at the Australian National University. Uh, so this is the uh, first workshop. Later on, we've got more talks. We've got three more workshops and we've got the closing. It's going to be a full day. Um, I hope that you can join us for it. I hope you enjoy it. Um, but before we go any too much further, I'd like to uh, welcome you to Canberra and to my place. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, Canberra is on Ngunnawal country. And uh, I'd like to, uh, to pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people and to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, that's not what this is about. We're here to talk about um, something very uh, specific, uh, which is about uh, our functions and packages. Now, this workshop could be a lot of things. Uh, this is a big universe of content. I'm, I've made the assumption in putting this workshop together that um, people will know what a function is and know what a package is, know the function goes within a package. Um, and, but I've made a bigger assumption than that, which is that there's um, a lot of freely available material. Uh, specifically, I direct you to, um, there's an R Packages book by Hadley Wickham. Um, there's also a uh, advanced R is very useful for people who are building packages as well. And that, that sort of technical information on the mechanics of how you put a, a package together is really just amazingly well developed now, much more so than when I started doing this stuff about a decade ago. And I thoroughly encourage you to read that stuff and its necessary background. But rather than repeat that as a, you know, as a less expert version of the people who wrote those, those texts, um, what I'm here to talk about today is, um, is basically my experience of developing packages, um, but more specifically to, to sort of guide you through what I think are the key principles in putting together a package or a function. And actually I'm, I'm gonna do it in, in sort of an unusual order and I'm gonna talk about why you'd wanna build a package in the first place and then talk about the, the functions as a detailed aspect of that rather than to try and explain to people what a, a function is and how it's constructed using code because I, I figure that people can, can work that out for themselves. So, um, you know, if that's your particular kettle of fish, I hope you enjoy the talk. Um, yeah, let's get going. So yeah, I'm gonna talk first about package design, then about the function design, and then I'm gonna talk about this, this process of improvement. And the reason why that's, uh, why that's at the end is because, you know, we're all human. Um, none of my software is perfect. I haven't found perfect software yet. So I, I think it's really important to, 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 um, to keep this quite an engaging sort of an activity. Uh, people write our package is because they want to do something that is important to them and useful to them. And that's a, that's a cheerful thing. Um, it shouldn't be held back by this, this fear of like being perfect, which I think a lot of us um, sort of get caught in that trap often. And so uh, my philosophy of this is um, if a package is going to help you, it doesn't matter what it looks like, it doesn't matter how clean your code is, um, knock something together that works for you, and that's all good. Um, but if it continues to be useful, let's try and make it better. And that's the philosophy that I take into my work and uh, it's the one that I'm gonna advocate that other people go with as well, if only for their own sort of health and well-being, as much as for producing useful software. So to, uh, to jump into that, I have opinions about what it should be in a package. Other people would have different opinions. People had formal um, you know, computer science qualifications would probably have better opinions than mine, uh, but I'm the one speaking, so here we go. So my view is that the first thing a package should be is practical. It should do something useful. Now, uh, there's a dude on Twitter called Cool But Useless who claims that he does deliberately useless things. I think that's, you know, actually his work is really fun. So I think that's not true even in his case, but for everyone else, typically the reason to write a package is because you need to do something a lot and um, an existing package um, doesn't cover the functionality that you need or, or doesn't work in the way that you want. So actually I've mistakenly covered my second dot point there. I think a package should not only be useful, but novel. If someone else has already done it, don't code it again. I'm gonna contradict myself there in the sense that there are there is value in some cases in learning something through writing a package. package. The actual 
act of building a package is actually quite simple now. So, so learning how to do something through packagizing is a, is a valid, like it's a teaching method really to yourself or others. And I think that's kind of fun, but that doesn't mean you need to share it with someone else. Um, so I think a package should be something that, that doesn't already exist. Clearly, that is not the case for a lot of like crown packages. And even some of my own work that I've later found out um, has been uh, already done or done better by someone else. Uh, but you know, this is what we aspire to here in this list. Um, I've said definable as my next dot point. I think a package should pick a thing and do it really well. What a thing is, is of course entirely vague and, and, and has no specific meaning, but I, I, if you find that you're writing many different kinds of functions do different, entirely different kinds of things on different kinds of data, then maybe you don't have one package, maybe you have many packages um, in an ideal world. Critically, a package, if you're going to um, give it to anyone else or even to be kind to your future self, um, a package should be usable. And by that, I mean, not just that it should actually work and not be full of bugs, but I think you should be able to roughly understand what it does quite quickly. Um, and there's some, there's some little like tricks to that. So having the name of the package as a help file in your package so that you can literally write question mark name of package and it will tell you something sensible and meaningful about the, that gives you an overview of that package is, is one really obvious way to, to help that. But if your package is convoluted and confusing, that's not going to save you. And I say that as someone who's, who's done this badly many times, perhaps arguably more than I've done it well. And the final point is that, that I think is on my critical list that didn't used to be is that things should be maintainable. And that means different things to different people as well. So for me, that used to be that I would be able to go back and look at my code and know what it did. So it was a sort of uh, an argument about for, for good um, documentation and, and uh, for making good comments on your code. I still think that's useful, but now maintainable is that I, you know, I no longer get paid to do a job that specifically says go away and write code some of the time. And so I have to find time to do this around other things or get funded. Um, and I think that's the case for a lot of people. So maintainable may be, I only want to spend, you know, a week a year on this or a day a year, or maybe I've got only half my year. I don't know what your, your, um, particular stopping rule is there. But for your conditions, package needs to be maintainable given your availability. And of course, that's not just a function of single package, but the suite of packages that you may choose to work on over time. Um, so I, this is simply a plea for, for uh, um, pragmatism in software development. Um, yeah. Otherwise, that's a matter for each individual developer as they see fit. There's two other things that I think would be kind of really nice in software, um, versatility. So what's been really satisfying to me as a package developer is when someone says, oh, look, I found your package and I want to do this thing. And it's amazing how often the thing that they say is really obscure to me. Um, maybe I'm just not very well read, but often there's very surprising applications that your packages can be put to. And to me, that's an, an ev evidence of that you've met some of the dot points above, the things, you know, someone can pick it up easily, use it and, and, and know what to do. Um, so I think versatility is a good principle. It's kind of hard to like build in, but it's, uh, it's a nice idea. And I guess, you know, to counteract that pragmatism idea before, there's an idealistic idea that maybe your package should be expandable. Maybe you'll have more time in the future. Maybe you'll have, um, you know, maybe it is easy to, um, add a little module to your work that makes it much more usable to more people. So the idea that something could be expanded if you wanted it to be is a useful one. Um, so the first package that I put together was called Circle Plot. I'm not going to focus on, you know, going into technical details of all my past work here. Um, but I've, I've included this uh, as, as an example of, of um, how you can judge yourself against these, these criteria. So circle plot, I've got a, still got a soft spot for it. It's written in base uh, plotting code um, and it's for network visualization around the circle, which, you know, is a subset, a very small subset actually of network design. Um, it's not always the best way to visualize data, but it can be kind of pretty. And that was sort of what I was going for. And it was also at this time a fun exercise in improving my trigonometry, which was atrocious. You know, you're, you're basically um, 
to link to nodes, which are the points around the edge here. You, you need to um, build a parabola. You need to um, transform it to attach to two nodes in a particular way. And it was a fun exercise in in writing code to, to that, that would work in a, in a um, sensible way with known mathematical properties and produce something pretty. I've kind of dropped work on circle plot mainly because I don't do much network visualization anymore. Uh, also because it, um, I prefer it was coded in ggplot2 and it's it's not and I don't have time to recode it. There are some features of base that make that uh, mean you can do slightly prettier things with circle plot than you probably could do in ggplot2. So maybe I should stick with it. But um, when we judge against these criteria that I put down the side, is it practical? Well, you know, it worked. So um, it, it did something that I needed at the time. It really doesn't anymore now, which is why I put it to one side. Is it novel? Uh, no, clearly not. There are other visualization tools for networks. Um, so it's how much you judge prettiness to be novel as to whether that is um, useful. It's definable. It's, it does a thing, it does one thing, does it well. So I'm pleased about that. Um, it's usable within reason. Um, but it turned out that because I now no longer do um, much work on networks and therefore don't need to visualize them, uh, it's lower priority and therefore it's become less maintainable even though the code is the same. Um, and so this is just a, a worked exercise to say, you know, if, uh, if you agree with these criteria, you could add your own, you could take some away. Uh, this is one way in which you could judge your software. Um, now, of course, that's easy for me to do because it's been a couple of years since I, I put this software together. Crikey, maybe five years. It's been a while. Um, when you're working on something and you've been working on it straight for six weeks, it can be harder to say, am I really making a useful use of my time? Because um, you can be too emotionally close to a product. Um, but in principle, these are useful, um, useful principles, I think. Um, but of course, a package is made up of functions. Um, and all you really want to do with a package is call a set of functions to do something you want. So there's, there's, uh, we've looked at, at a package at a broad scale, how um, without going into detail about the content of your particular package, there are some rules that I think are useful for judging whether it's useful. But once you've decided that you want to build a, a, a package, you probably already have some functions in place. So how do we architect those functions in, in the most efficient way? And this is a smaller list and perhaps that's because it's less well thought out. Maybe it's an easier problem. I'm not really sure which. Um, it's probably not an easier problem. But um, I also have some views on what functions should be. I think they should be simple um, in, in the sense that they should take as few arguments as possible and return as few objects as possible. There are times when that is hopelessly optimistic and impossible. The obvious one is, is statistical models, um, which are inherently complex. You need to supply data, you need to supply a formula, you need to supply, depending on the kind of modeling you're doing, you may need to parameterize the optimization. Uh, and all that information needs to be stored in, in the resulting object. So, it, and that's why, for example, it's very common for um, modeling um, packages to return S4 objects rather than data frames. Just, you, there's too much information in them for it to be stored in a data frame. Um, and that's not gonna change why Broom exists, example, for example. So clearly there are cases where the simple argument, which is my first and most important one, just drops off completely. But for those of us who are doing something that, that is a little less technical, maybe we want to do a visualization project like I just showed, or maybe we want to uh, take data from a particular source and make sure it's consistent. Um, consistently formatted or something like that. Uh, in that case, um, there's very few excuses for not having simple um, functions, even if that means having more of them than, uh, than you normally would. Um, so my description of that probably incorporates this brief idea, it should have as few arguments as possible. Um, and the critical thing, and, and this is, um, this sounds really boring. Make sure your functions are well documented, because I can write a function in the morning and forget by the afternoon precisely every aspect of it. You know, what, what, uh, what sort of object it accepts as an input, what sort of object it returns, precisely what the arguments mean. If I haven't documented that as I'm like thinking it through and as I'm, as I'm writing that code, um, 
then then it's very difficult for me to come back to it and therefore it's impossible for someone else to the put the point in brackets there is commented so th this often gets missed a lot but often there's complexity within a function that is is also difficult to reread why did i do write this particular line what purpose does it do what's the flow of arguments within this uh, of, of functions within my function so i'd argue for commenting within a function as well as documenting it properly so as an example of that, I uh, mentioned earlier on that I uh, work for an organization called the Atlas of Living Australia. We have an R package. Um, so uh, the, the, the caveat to this is I've been at ALA for six months and, and ALA has been in existence for 10 years. And so our, our package predates my presence with the company. And, um, and that's fine. You know, I don't work everywhere. Uh, but uh, when I arrived, there was already an exercise underway to, to evaluate some of our software, of which ALA for R was one of them, and the, the lead developer on that, uh, Matilda Stevenson, was of the opinion that um, that it wasn't the best maintained piece of software. Oh, no, it was maintained well, it was just hard to use. And so I've put literally the help files from uh, on the left here, you'll see the um, the original version, which is what we started with, and then we've got a, a new package, which we've codenamed Koala for now. Uh, we're actually running a Twitter vote on what we should call this, so you know, hop on my Twitter feed if you want to um, give me an opinion. Um, to do the same thing. Now, Atlas of Living Australia is a piece of, uh, it's a website, but it's a piece of research infrastructure that stores observations of, of um, biodiversity of individual species. And people can download those records and, and do modeling on them. That's all we do, really. Um, and the way you get that data from um, through R is you previously would use this occurrences function. And, and I'm not sure if people can see my mouse here, but I mean, I'm not going to count this up, but that's maybe a dozen arguments. Um, more than the fact there's a lot of arguments is that they have different formats. So some of them require a particular function. Some of them require, you know, Obviously, some will require, require different kinds of input, like logical and text and things. But the idea that some would, it, 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 it's a little bit too diverse. It's also, what was really confusing to me coming to this initially is that a lot of these are codes. You notice that the, you, the arguments are named things like WKT, FQ, QA. Um, it, don't get me wrong, some acronyms are widely accepted and widely understood, but some are not. And uh, to come into a package and try and, and make sense of this is, is challenging. And so through the process of, of discussing what needs to be in, the, the counterpoint to that complexity is that that's there for a reason. It actually helps people um, get the information they need. And so we needed to retain a function that was versatile without, um, but, but also one that had fewer arguments. And so we've managed to do that. We've, we've basically brought it down to one that has five arguments. One of them is simply um, true or false. Uh, but all the rest call subfunctions. Uh, so you say, okay, well, I, I need to tell um, ALA in my query what taxonomic group I want data on. So there's a function to look up taxonomic groups. And, and we have a thing called filters, which says, well, actually, um, I don't want every record, I only want them that meet certain criteria. So now we need to specify filters as another function for that. So um, the hope is then that, that this, and we haven't wrote this, this, maybe I'm being naive, but the hope is that, that, we, that by simplifying this into things that are human readable and that have further help on each individual item and that there are fewer of them, hopefully that makes it easier for new users to come in and use this piece of software. Still in development, so um, you know we'll see. And what should come out of that uh, example that I think is a, an important general point, regardless of whether you're working on, on this kind of data or any other, is that, that the idea that I've asked about before, brevity, so having um, simple functions implies modularity or, 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 and perhaps even nestedness. So if you have a function that previously accepted 10 different kinds of arguments, um, maybe that's several different functions, maybe it's um, one function with many sub-functions in it. Um, if you're going to make individual functions do a single thing, you're going to need more of them to do the same number of things. Does that make sense? I don't know why I'm asking. You can't reply. Um, so it's, it's a fairly accepted convention that having small modular nested functions is, um, is a good idea. It's easy to interpret. It's easy to maintain. It does 
it does lead to a question of how much many of those functions you will end up with more functions than you you would have started with so some um in some cases that means that you'll you'll have very niche functions that, that other people don't need to see so that it leads to a question of which should be internal versus external so which you expose to your use and which you don't um that's usually a fairly easy thing to do the the harder problem is that it implies that your your package will very quickly develop an architecture a, a degree of nestedness that, that can become quite complex and how it interacts with your workflow as well can be quite complex and so my um experience of that is that it's often useful to um, having a naming convention that, that, that reflects that architecture and just to show you what I'm talking about here this is the same this is a sort of an architecture diagram for that same function that I showed before so the new version is called uh, ALA occurrences there's another function called ALA counts which has similar arguments and so that's why they're both there together um, and this is the result. It's a little messy. So um, each everything in bold is a is a function name. Everything that's indented and not in bold underneath it is an argument to that function. And what the details of this clearly don't matter to most people. Um, you may not wish to use this piece of software, but the point is that each um, we have a a name convention whereby the uh, the biggest functions, the ones that people will call most of the time, um, have a have a standard preface uh, prefix, so which is ALA, which is short for Alice Living Australia, and then an underscore, and then um, something that they do. They get occurrences, they get counts, they get taxonomic information. Um, then the arguments underneath them are at least human readable, but they're also um, the name of the argument is a clue to the name of the function that you need to call. So if you need to pass a filters argument to ALA occurrences, you need to go then select filters. If you need location data, you need to go select locations. And for some of these, that's even not enough information because it might be that you want to, we have, let's have a look, what's a good example? Um, there's a reason why it's columns on the R side, which is what you, the, the columns of data you get out. Uh, but there's fields on the ALA side. So this actually breaks the rule I just gave, which shows that nothing is consistent in the software. Um, so this is our longest chain here where you go, okay, well, I want a certain number of columns. So I have to choose them from the fields that ALA provide, which means I need to find the fields, but then I also may want to know what's within each given field. And so we, we then have another level of nestiness where you can find things and then you can find the attributes of those things. And so the, name, the, the point here is that the naming convention reflects the architecture and that should make it easier to navigate along with the fact that our help pages will link to one another and so again it may be that people who are watching this don't care about the particular architecture of a single package and that's fair but the point is that this is not the sort of thing that you can diagram that you can get from simply working on single functions in isolation it's about how your whole package works and therefore how your naming um helps people to use the package and makes it easier to use. And, and the way I think it's useful to do that is to have the function naming reflect its its, uh, its position in the architecture. And the, the classic example of this is ggplot2. So um, if you want to draw a ggplot, um, the, you literally write the function ggplot, which has no underscores, no suffixes of any kind. Sub arguments to that are double barrel, g on point, g on line. Um, you know, theme void, whatever. Um, things that affect how themes are displayed, things like you um, are triple barreled, scale, fill, color, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and then finally within the theme, there's um, quadruple barreled things that tell you about, you know, this aspect of this theme needs to equal this. And those ones, there's a slight break from tradition there where those are. I guess because they're not functions, they're, they're dots to separate them rather than um, underscores. So sim the act of typing something, typing a function name or an argument name, tells you that you're typing a function or an argument where it sits in the hierarchy. And so that sort of like implicit cue, I think, is a really fantastic model. Um, and I'm blatantly stealing it in all my software. So that's that my view of function package design. Um, others may disagree. I, I, I don't know. Um, 
but they've been useful in a few projects as I hope I've demonstrated. Um, and the final point is, is sort of circling back on where we started, which say that no package is perfect first time. And I've, you know, and I've highlighted ggplot2, which is a package I use every day. Um, and and I, so I hope that doesn't come across as mean, but um, sometimes you don't get things right first time. And there is an earlier ggplot and it does work in a different way and it was deemed to be less suitable. So, you know, happens to the best of us. Um, it's not always the case that you have to start again from scratch, though. It is often possible, particularly where the stakes are lower and where you've got um, a piece of software that maybe not as many people are using, um, or the changes are, you know, the, the, the conventions for, for turning over um, the naming of functions um, that, that don't mess your users around too much. Um, so I've put up these, these um, package conditions, and the reason I've done that is because I find it useful to revisit them. So I often um, have, have breaks from a particular project. There's, a, there's usually a sprint to try and finish something when it's, when it's had a lot of work and I think, oh, I've got to get a release out and you spend, you know, a couple of weeks working really intensely on something. And then I might come back three months or six months later and say, well, let's, let's apply these criteria and say, look, are we meeting all of these, these things? And, 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 you know, that, that's always a, uh, it's never a yes, no answer. It's always could be doing better. How could we be doing it? I find issues on, on GitHub are a really useful um, way for me to, to, um, to, to, to know that as well, uh, to, to get a, uh, an idea of whether we, we meet these criteria well enough. And so um, I'm just going to talk briefly then about how some examples of, of how I think they can work best. So um, this is a, a, a diagram of the, the workflow in a, a package that I wrote called RevTools. I gave a talk on it yesterday at the conference, uh, but it's for basically for, um, for, for screening during systematic reviews. So, I, uh, and specifically screening is assisted by displaying the results of a topic model, which, which categorizes text according to their, their content. Um, so I knew when I started developing RevTools that I wanted this screen topics, it wasn't called that at the time because naming is hard. RevTools was actually called something else as well. So the package and function names have changed over time, which is proof of my concept here. Um, but I knew I wanted that. I wanted some way of merging screening with topic models. Getting to that was really hard. I needed some way of um, reading in um, data from uh, standard bibliographic formats. Um, so I wrote some import code. Um, I needed to use a lot of uh, like natural language processing technologies, building a, a, a matrix of the um, documents versus terms, that, which we call document term matrix or document feature matrix, depending on which one you want to choose. Um, so I wrote some code for that. And um, what I, the, the one bit that I really didn't want to do myself was the actual topic modeling code itself. So I, I outsourced that, but, but that needed to be integrated um, and made consistent with the other functions in the package. So that's the workflow. And so you could basically, in the first version of RevTools, you could say, um, I can either pass the data straight to screen topics and screen topics will do the topic modeling for me and sort of in the background, um, or I can do some modeling um, myself outside of screen topics, but then I can't visualize it. Um, so just to show how that has changed through time, um, this, br this breaks the rule of a package to do one thing. This package does too many things. Um, in effect, it's got code for NLP, it's got code for import export, it's got code for screening. So the most obvious thing to do is spin off the import export code. So there's a new package synthesizer as a result of collaboration, uh, between myself and Eliza Grames. Um, so basically we took all the import export code out of RevTools and put some, you know, tidying stuff on top of it um, and put that somewhere else. And so the next version of RevTools doesn't have to have an entire code base for, for import and export, uh, meaning someone can use synthesizer if they don't want to do screening, but do need that to bring that kind of data in. Um, making document term matrices in a consistent and accurate ways is not terrifically easy. And there's a few ways to do it, but I feel on reflection that these the people who wrote Quanta to do it better than I do. So the new version of RevTools just uses, um, does the same things it did before, like at the same sequence of, of tasks, um, 
but it uses quantity to do them rather than its own code. So that reduces my maintenance burden, um, which which was another uh, criteria for whether a package is successful is whether it's easy to maintain. Um, and the topic modeling, um, I've switched over to a, a different modeling package that is uh, has got more capabilities in it than, than the previous one that I was using. So it's another form of outsourcing, I guess, uh, and and making sure that the package is current and is use, is useful to as many people as possible. So now. What VirtuTools does is screen topics and well, there's other forms of screening app in there as well, but it does screening. And so we've gotten closer to that argument of um, the, the packages should do one thing and do one thing well. Not there entirely yet. Um, the other thing that um, I've done is uh, add some extra functionality. So to say previously you had to either pass, if you import some bibliographic data, you had to pass it to um, a screening app or you could run a model on it, but you could, if you didn't run a model on it, you couldn't do much with that model. And so now it's um, to make this more, more versatile, simply added some code that enables you to run your own topic model, um, which is, you know, means that you could feasibly run it over days rather than um, waiting for your shiny app to load. Um, and then you can pass that to screen topics as a visualization tool, or you can plot some, um, some uh, GG plots out of it. Some some sensible summaries, the same things you would get if you did um, if you ran screen topics, uh, but in a static way. Uh, and maybe that's all some people need, and it's not a difficult thing to build on top of it. So we've we've, I guess this has increased the versatility. It makes it more useful to more people, um, and that's as a result of its modularity that you could um, the fact that these things were easy to add on extra uh, elements um, made it more extensible, which I think is a is a useful feature. So look, that's all I'm really going to talk about. We're at uh, about half an hour for this workshop um, of the you know 45 or 50 minutes. So um, in principle, normally this is where I'd take questions. For an online conference, that's a bit more challenging. But uh, thanks for your time. And do feel free to reach out. I'm on the Slack channel, but um, email is a more stable long-term solution. Um, and I hope you found this a useful talk. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Martin. Um, there are a couple of questions on Slack. Um, couple Lovely. Me, in fact. Um, one question is, how much do you use those conceptual models or those architectural design diagrams or schematics when you're starting out with a package and how much does it grow more iteratively or organically? It's all, um, it's I was going to say I retcon it. I don't know if that's actually the right word. So in, in, in practice, often when I'm developing a package, I don't, it's because I need something done quickly or uh, it's because I want to see if something's possible. So you're either um, prototyping or you've already done a bunch of code and you're just packagizing it, right? So it may, and that meets enough criteria for me to be happy. If it means that, um, I get to reuse some code in a slightly cleaner way, or that code is slightly better documented than it would otherwise be during my day-to-day -day workflow, then that's enough for me to use in-house. Um, so initially I might start with just one or two of them. And then my, my experience is that over time, I, I, I tend to, to sort of um, converge on those, those criteria. And you know what? I don't think I'm there for any of my software, but... Um, you know, you live in hope, right? <laughs> Thanks very much. And it kind of related note, you, you said you've done um, like about five packages. Some of those presumably were you on your own and some were more collaborative, I know. Um, yeah. Do you think you approach sole working packages differently to, and the functions as well, to when you're collaborating? Do you do you have to necessarily plan a little bit more or do you share work, produce different functions then and then overlap? Do you start off with vignettes? How, how does that process work for you? Yeah, look, I, I think actually teamwork makes me better as a, as a coder because it forces, you, you can't divide work up unless you have an idea of your architecture, right? And you can't, um, justify spending four or five people's time on something unless you already know it's a good idea. So um, I feel like working in a team enforces best practice a bit. 
Um, and that's actually, I noticed this, for the, the prime collaborative work I did before I started my new job was working on, uh, on Emmy Atlas, which was a product that came out of uh, the first evidence synthesis hackathon in Stockholm in 2018. And I'll be honest, I wasn't even in the room for, the, for those early discussions about architecture and what was most important about that to be done. Uh, but what it did mean was that um, when there was a need for, for some more support or some questions or someone wanted to know, oh, how do we stably store data within a Shiny app? Everything else was already in place and, and there was an amazing architecture and, and, a, and a division of labor. And so you could literally come and drop in your modular piece of software into an existing architecture. I, when I'm working by myself, and I don't know to what extent this is true of everyone, I'm just so like grateful to have, I'm usually quite excited about the, pro, the prospect. Like if I'm gonna be writing a new package, it's because I think something's really urgent, really exciting. And so I don't always do my due diligence to say, is this really critical? Have you really checked, you know, GitHub and CRAN to make sure that this doesn't exist already? Um, have you really thought about the architecture? And, and if I did that, it would save me a lot of time down the track. But it also means that you, you know, it's a lower stakes if your initial project fails. Like if you decide after a day of coding something impossible or um, would take, you, you probably, you might have an idea of um, maybe this project will take a year of coding to finish and I don't want to do that. It doesn't help you get to get to that point quicker. So I guess it swings and roundabouts. Great. Thanks very much. And then a uh, sort of follow up question. Um, Thinking as someone who's just started out writing functions and packages now um, very recently, um, to what extent do you think it's it's vital to follow the sort of best practices in how you build functions within one R script or do you split them? How do you structure your folders in your um, package? So the kind of things that get by the checks of CRAM and the kind of things that are expected as best practice. Because me as a, as a beginner, I'm a little bit nervous about releasing a package or uploading it to CRAN, thinking that I'm doing the bare minimum. Uh, it's, it's passing the requirements, but are people going to look at it and think, gosh, he doesn't know what he's doing when it comes to designing functions? Well, look, I would say that um, I certainly I don't meet best practice perhaps at all, you know? <laughs> um, no, I was gonna say most of the time, but it, it, in some of the software I've written, uh, they don't have, there's not enough tests um, that are, you know, that's to say I don't use tests that well enough. Um, I have tests on my own machine, but that's not really reproducible. Um, I feel like if you're creating something new and it's potentially useful and you're sharing it, that's to be celebrated. Um, I, th I think this principle of iterative improvement is, shouldn't be like a, something that hangs around your neck, like, oh, I've got to keep improving all the time, or I've got to, got to attain a certain level before I share. I think it's, uh, it should be in something encouraging that, you know, even uh, there's been a bit of a trend in the last uh, couple of years, someone saying, oh, do you reckon we could write in a tweet a function that would do this amazing thing? And it's amazing how often someone can do that and can work out how to do it in about five minutes. And that's, that's like enriched the R universe in some way. You know what I mean? Like someone's learned from that. And it's surprising how um, often someone says, <laughs> how, no, it's not frequent, but when it does happen, it's nice. I have had emails in the past where someone said, oh, look, I don't actually use your package that much, but I, you know, I delved into it and it taught me how to do something and that was really useful to me. And now I do this thing with it. Um, so, you know, in a sense, the outcome that I wanted and the outcome they wanted was just entirely different, almost non-overlapping, but someone still learned from that. And I think that's the joy of our, like it's, it, um, it's community. So I'd say share, early share often. Brilliant, but from my perspective, I find that really reassuring. Thank you very much. Oh, good. Oh, it's a terrifying thing to do. Like um, it's really, uh, really intimidating. And, and, you know, it's easy for me to say I haven't been doing it for uh, 10 years or something. Um, if it was my first script, I think I'd feel very anxious about that. Yeah, I think as well, I would say, I, I, so I have one package on CRAN and then um, quite a few packages on, on GitHub. I'm definitely not an expert, but getting my one package onto CRAN, which is incredibly basic. It's just testing the length of title words and how many stop words are in your title when you're writing manuscripts and whether the words are in the title and the abstract. It's, it's basically a calculator, it's really simple. But just that process of going through the process of, 
putting it out there, getting it onto Crown was a massive learning experience for me. Um, obviously, you don't want to put something out there that's, that doesn't function or that does something wrong. But that process was really vital for me. Is the same yeah. for you? Yeah, absolutely. I remember feeling really quite proud of myself for, for having done that. And it's funny, like, um, Crown gets a, a bit of stick for, for enforcing some standards that are di sometimes difficult to meet. Um, and, you know, you are going to want to make sure that your package isn't full of bugs before you put it on there. And that's hard to do. Um, but I still feel like even though it's easier to use GitHub these days, I do feel there's a set, there's a professionalism to having things on CRAN and um, particularly for, um, for projects where you're trying to establish things like standard workflows, CRAN provides a stability that is hard to replicate. It would be very easy for me to delete my entire GitHub profile after this talk and that just saying that out loud, out loud terrifies me, um, but it, it is possible. And, and it's possible that um, if someone like, if Wolfgang Wiechbauer did that and didn't have his work on CRAN, I mean, can you imagine the, the impact that would have on the research community that was doing meta-analysis? It would be atrocious. And so I think CRAN just by being stable and enforcing some basic standards plays just a critical role and I've noticed that in trying to maintain a metaverse project, which is about defining workflows, that th there's things that people want to do that because they're not on CRAN are hard to standardize. And so I'd, I'd advocate for it um, if there's a piece of work that you think is valuable and, and should be available long term. Great. Thank you very much. Um, no and then uh, just a quick question. Can you just say something quickly about citation and um, what people can do to make their work citable and if that's advantageous? Um, so before it's written up in a paper, so that people can give credit for that that work, even if it's not yet on CRAN. Yeah, that's that's not terribly easy. I I've tended to, um, I mean, there's a citation argument right in a package, so you can tell people what you want, and I try and follow that. Um, and to, I, for the software that I've had published, I try and get the paper cited. If that's not available, it will be the uh, the CRAN version, which usually has a standard format. For GitHub, I haven't seen it as much, honestly, in academic publications. Um, but it is happening. Um, I'm sure I'm just like, you know, two years behind on, on what the latest trends are for citation there. Uh, I, I think, though, that you're right, that that is the motivation for a lot of people. No, it's not the motivation. It's the reward, right? Someone spends years of their own time um, working on this piece of software, and then if it gets cited, then they can say to their, you know, if they're working in a university that, that someone used it and it was valuable. And I do, so I do think there is a respect there that, that's important. And so I've, I've certainly made it uh, a priority to try and cite as much of the software as I can, that I can, that I've used. But that does get difficult if you've got a very vers um, project that includes a lot of software, but I think it's, um, we do it to authors of other forms of um, knowledge. So I think we should do it for software too. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Nice. Uh, and then uh, one final question. Um, oh, from uh, from Cosette Coma. This question has come in. Um, thanks so much. That was really interesting. If this time, could you say a bit about your coding experience prior to your first package? Is there any kind of lead up experience, practice, or lesson that you might suggest for beginners? That's a really good question. Thanks, Cosette. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Um, look, it's funny though. I, I... Yeah, I could talk, talk about my experience and I can cover that briefly. Um, it, it's a little bit difficult because the world's different now. You know, there's so much more material out there about how to produce a package. But when, when I started coding in R, it was literally, I, had, I was an honours student um, and I had some scripts from my supervisor and I had to work out how to open R. This was before R Studio existed. So I had to work out how to open it, how to type things in, what typing things in did. I had no computer science background. Um, and similarly, before I started writing my first package, I, um, I don't even know if I'd written a function before, actually, um, or very rarely. Um, I just found that I kept repeating code. And um, so I, I'd use that as a lesson to say that you don't have to be an expert in everything. You don't have to have, everyone always, always seems to think that they need more expertise than they have. And we, Neil and I, have talked about this before at our hackathon events where everyone in the room, no matter how experienced they are, feels that they're unqualified to be there. And telling people they're not is an important lesson. 
and uh, and I think that's the same for the art community. Everyone just by showing up is qualified to be there, and their input is welcome. And you don't need to. There's there's no bar that you have to jump to to um, to be worth writing a package. Thanks very much. That's really interesting. I think that's a, a really good point. Like, at what point do you do you reach that stage where you can say yes, I'm qualified enough to write a package? I think yeah. That's a good question. Um, I had another question just just briefly from my perspective when I started I was quite worried about etiquette in terms of borrowing other people's code or using right. their code and I was wondering when is it okay to build on someone's work um, and how should you reach out to them uh, or acknowledge their work obviously if there's a package and you're using it as a dependency that's a bit clearer but if if someone's used something that you don't want the whole package, you just want a little chunk of it. That's quite cool. Like, what's what's your view on the etiquette there? Yeah, look, I, I feel like dependencies are, are the the best practice if you can. But you're right; there are times where someone's written, you know, a thousand functions, and one of them is useful, and you don't want all that code. Um, look, I think. Um, it depends a little bit on the extent. I've had people, um, I, I saw someone had forked one of my uh, repositories and done some fun things with it um, to, to add functionality and, and, uh, and that we're using it on their own project. And I thought that was just a really neat thing. If they then published a, like a paper from it saying, oh, we've written this software that does this thing, I think I'd have felt pretty aggrieved by that. And so it's, it's hard to answer in general. Um, I think, um, I think the, by all means do something, but, but, but ask them. Um, I think, you know, communication is always a good thing. Part of our uh, impetus for setting up the hackathon was to, to facilitate that sort of work, actually. Someone say, oh, no, I've written some code for this here, use this, um, and make that, that, because people are worried about that communication aspect and, and approaching people they don't know. Um, I think most people will be open to it most of the time, and I think asking is okay. That's a really great answer. Thanks very much. Um, so that's all the questions that have come in so far. Um, we're starting the next session um, on the dot at 8 GMT. So I don't know if you want, if there's anything else you want to talk about or... Um, if... No, I think we can leave it there. I, I don't want to, you know, no need to drag things out that people don't need to, um, except to say that um, I hope people found this useful. Thanks for the questions. Um, and feel free to reach out via, via email, Twitter, whatever works. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Much. That was a really great session. And uh, we can carry on taking questions and answers on Slack or on YouTube comments if people want.